what I'll do is I'll introduce the next speaker, is Professor Yuval Dor. Uh, Yuval Dor uh, works at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and the Hasadah. I never say whether, remember whether it's Hadassah. It's Hadassah, not Hasadah. It's Hadassah Medical School also in, in Jerusalem. Uh, he, he did a very successful uh, postdoc in, uh, at Harvard with Doug Melton, and that's from where I remember your first papers on beta cells and, and also, and particularly in the regeneration and the mechanism of regeneration of beta cell. He has had a lot of interest and when he moved back in Jerusalem. He has produced a lot of fundamental contributions to understanding the regeneration of beta cell and many other aspects of the beta cell biology. Um, you have also other interests that are on your bio there but I would like to invite you just to come here and to present and, and give your presentation. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edward, for this. Do you hear me? Yep. Yep. Sí. So, thanks very much, Edward, for this kind of invitation, for the introduction, for the kind invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so, I changed the title a little bit closely related to aging, but really what I want to focus on is on our, our current understanding of what causes beta cell failure in type 2 um, diabetes. Um, so I guess this audience needs no um, introduction to what is a beta cell, very superficially, a superficially a simple machine that has to sense glucose and secrete insulin accordingly. There's more to that, of course. So I want to start with our current simple understanding of, how, of the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes, or the natural history of type 2 diabetes. So according to what we understand today, everything starts from uh, reduced, this is a long timeline of years to decades, which brings us to aging. Uh, but everything starts from reduced insulin sensitivity in the periphery, or if you will, increased insulin resistance. This, in all people, initially leads to a compensation in beta cell function. So reduced insulin sensitivity coupled with increased beta cell function, more insulin secretion, maintains your glucose levels normal. For 80% of the people in this situation, everything continues like that forever, and they are fine. These are people with metabolic syndrome, but no diabetes. 20% of the population at some point undergo a redu reduced beta cell mass, what we call beta cell failure. So in reduced beta cell function in the face of increased insulin resistance causes the development of hyperglycemia and, of course, eventually uh, vascular complications of diabetes. So this is really how we see the essence of type 2 diabetes these days. And I want to uh, um, go quickly through the key uh, steps here. So first, the first stage, which was discussed uh, in the last talk, of course, has to do with uh, what causes really the primary event of what causes insulin resistance is, of course, Western lifestyle, Western diet, probably carbohydrates, little exercise, and leading to uh, obesity. I will not talk about uh, that further. Um, the second interesting step that my lab is working on and many others is, of course, this stage of com beta cell compensation. So what, what is it? We don't even understand what it is. So, there, of course, there's increased, there might be increased functionality, so each beta cell works harder. Um, there might be an increase in total beta cell number, or maybe even beta cell size. Surprisingly, we're not even sure about that. And, and we, one, one hypothesis is that since these stages often take place in, in adults and even old adults, then the process of beta cell um, uh, senescence, uh, a phenomenon which I will not talk about too much, which really greatly limits the, the potential of cells to proliferate, it is possible that beta cell senescence limit, may limit the, the, the ability of the individual to increase uh, beta cell mass, li leading to, to this uh, to this failure eventually, but we, we, this is really an area of active research. We don't know much about that. I want to focus much, much of my talk today about this interesting stage, taking step taking place in, in about, as I said, 20% of those individuals, uh, beta cell failure. Now, we know this has very strong genetic components. Much of the GWAS, genome-wide association studies, hits um, for type 2 diabetes, surprisingly, initially uh, uh, um, pointed to, to genes that have to do with the ability with, with, with beta cells. So this, this is genetically uh, uh, determined in a sense, but really not fully understood. But what, what is it? 
again, surprisingly, we're not entirely sure, and there are competing, not mutually exclusive theories, which I would like to discuss today. So uh, we, we think this has to do with reduced beta cell, total beta cell mass, reduced number of beta cells, uh, a major component of beta cell dysfunction. They just don't work right. And a, a newer hypothesis, which I'll focus on most of, most of my talk, is the idea that there's, uh, in this stage, there's compromised beta cell identity. There's, they stop. They're, they stop become beta cells, they turn to something else. So um, here, here is uh, 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 an, a blow up of, of, of this concept or, or path, presumed pathways for beta cell failure. So as I said, one idea is that there is reduced beta cell mass. These are the islets and then here in the islet, so reduced beta cell mass due to um, several potential explanations, which I'll talk about in a second. Another idea is that uh, Again, several factors cause beta cell dysfunction, inability to properly secrete insulin. And the third most novel idea is, is that the idea of this de-differentiation leading to compromised uh, beta cell identity. And I'll go over these uh, now. So the first uh, 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 idea is, is that there is um, beta cell failure is because of reduced beta cell uh, mass. And, and I think this all started from uh, really seminal work by Peter Butler uh, in 2003, showing using autopsies from the Mayo Clinic, he looked at the pancreas of people who died due to type 2 with type 2 diabetes. So with no type 2 diabetes, he found that patients with type 2 diabetes had 50% lower beta cell mass. This really started it all, I think. And, and, and why do they have lower beta cell mass? Several possibilities. One, of course, is that there is extensive beta cell death during type 2 diabetes. This remains highly controversial with very little evidence. Uh, very difficult to show really ongoing beta cell death in type 2 diabetes, but existing hypothesis. An alternative hypothesis is that those individuals who go on to develop type 2 diabetes fail to increase their beta cell mass. So there is uh, increased demand because of insulin resistance, but, but those people that fail to increase their beta cell mass uh, uh, go on to beta cell failure. And again, potentially, this is because of this age-related decline in beta cell proliferation. We know that adult humans, essentially at, uh, above the age of, age of 15 or so, have a very little uh, capacity for beta cell uh, replication. Um, another possibility, which is <laughs> actually my favorite hypothesis, but, but really evidence is, is circumstantial, is that this does have to do with age, but, but from the different uh, uh, side of the, of the age uh, arrow. And, and the idea is that there, is, uh, um, there are people that have reduced beta cell mass from the start. So the, the concept is that the combination of genetics that make your beta cell proliferate less, plus environmental events that take place in utero or, or early postnatal life, this will lead to, to, via affecting beta cell proliferation, proliferation, lead to your final beta cell mass already when you're a child. And indeed, there's a... There, and, and, Butler also showed that there is a huge variation in, in beta cell mass in, in, in healthy individuals, right? Really more than, I think, the variation in any other organ. And the, the, the idea is that those people that are born from the start with lower beta cell mass, these are the ones that may not be able to cope with, with uh, increased uh, demand uh, later on uh, in life when there's chronic increased demand because of um, insulin resistance. So this, may remind some of you the famous uh, Barker hypothesis, so-called the fetal origins of adult metabolic disease. So Barker hypothesized that really much of what uh, determines adult metabolic disease is, is events that take place during uh, actually fetal life. Um, what can we do uh, about that, uh, reduce beta cell mass? No, not much at this stage. Uh, I think that one of the a uh, uh, few things that um, may work based on animal studies is that um, uh, GLP mimetics, uh, uh, DPP inhibitors or, or GLP-1 uh, um, um, GLP receptor agonists uh, may prevent or in increase beta cell survival, prevent beta cell death. So that could be, this might be a mechanism uh, for prevention of type 2 diabetes. Um, Many people are, are uh, uh, entertaining the idea of enhancing beta cell mass in type 2 diabetes by either regenerative therapies causing beta, cells to, to, to ex beta cell mass to expand. My lab is working extensively on that. And alternatively, islet uh, transplantation. But uh, the short 
uh, summary of that is I think regenerative therapies are far from being ready for prime time for human studies and, and islet transplantation in type 2 diabetes with all the complications of, of associated with immune suppression I think is not uh, realistic at this stage. And um, another perspective on that is that if, if you're stuck with low beta cell mass, perhaps the best thing to do is really to match the demand to your beta cell capacity and, and by, by improving insulin sensitivity. And I actually think that this is how uh, famously bariatric surgery cures diabetes. Not, not by affecting beta cells, but by drastically reducing uh, insulin uh, resistance, which will then is better matched to, to the potential of the beta cells of that individual. This was first hypothesis for beta cell failure, um, 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 reduced beta cell mass. Um, the second uh, concept is, is uh, uh, beta cell dysfunction, which is probably the most important factor. Beta cells just don't function well. Um, we know much about this process, but not enough. Uh, um, the driving force for beta cell dysfunction is thought to be a combination of islet inflammation, maybe because of adipokines coming from uh, adipose tissue, plus glucolipotoxicity, the toxic effects of high glucose and high lipids on beta cells. The proposed intracellular mechanisms are um, that chronic hyperglycemia or lipidemia may cause uh, beta cell oxidative stress or endoplasmic reticulum stress, which then shuts off much of the uh, activities in, 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 in beta cells. And, and perhaps most importantly, this ER stress is thought to cause uh, inefficient processing of pro-insulin within the ER, you know, the removal of C-peptide and generation of bioactive insulin, and this causes the secretion of inactive insulin. And this starts a vicious cycle, because if, you secre if a beta cell secretes inactive insulin, this does not reduce glycemia, so more will be secreted, the more stress um, will occur. The, the, the physiological manifestation of that is very early loss of first phase insulin secretion in type 2 diabetics. Um, and, 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 and most importantly, I think there is extensive evidence for a reversible nature of this dysfunction. So when, when, when demand or metabolic environment are normalized, um, most evidence suggests that beta cell failure is kind of relieved and, and it goes back to normal, to the normal potential of that individual. Um, uh, what can we do about that? What is actionable? Uh, again, I have only two points to make. One is that, again, GLP mimetics may enhance beta cell function. There is evidence for that via um, the amplifying, so called amplifying pathway. But another uh, important and uh, somewhat provocative point that I want to make is that most evidence suggests that uh, drugs. That, that boost uh, uh, the, the, the classical um, secretion pathway, the insulin, glucose-stimulated insulin secretion pathway, we do have drugs like that. These actually seem to improve beta cell function in the short term, but in the long term actually to cause deterioration, and maybe even beta cell death. And I'm talking about, about via enhanced uh, uh, calcium toxicity. I'm talking about the classical uh, sulfonylurea drugs, the uh, glabenclamide uh, family. And, and, um, and the still experimental to be abundant, uh, small molecule glucokinase activators, uh, GKAs. Um, many pharma companies try that. These drugs that boost glucokinase cause increased secretion of insulin by beta cells, which looks like a good thing. But then within a very short term in mice as well as in, uh, in humans, the effect goes away and, and perhaps perhaps by also damaging the beta cells. So this is not good. The one thing that does seem to improve beta cell function is, is, is GLP, is the amplifying pathway. And, and the third uh, concept for and most uh, novel and, and provocative might be new to many of you is, is this third arm of a compromised uh, identity of beta cells. And this little drawing, if red are beta cells, we see cells that are just there. They are there, but they are not beta cells anymore. And this really started with a very uh, uh, important paper five years ago by Mimo Achille group in, in, in Colombia, uh, pancreatic beta cell de-differentiation as a mechanism of beta cell failure. And what they did in that paper, it was based purely on a, on a mouse, on an artificial transgenic mouse system. The details of this, of this particular system don't matter so much, but the idea was that uh, the model they suggested that hyperglycemia via loss of FOXO1, transcription factor in beta cells, doesn't matter so much, leads to uh, induction of uh, embryonic factors, both neurogenin 3, which is a transcription factor that is uh, in embryonic life determining the formation of different uh, endocrine cell types, plus even more provocatively, 
uh, in, uh, induction of uh, embryonic stem cells factors. If cells go back in time, become embryonic, and then lose their beta cell identity and even gain the expression of non-insulin hormones. So they start to express, starting from a beta cell, they, they, they eventually uh, end up being negative for insulin and, and positive for other hormones like somatostatin and, 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 um, and uh, glucagon. And his suggestion was that this is why Butler sees a reduction of 50% in beta cell mass, because the cells just don't stain for insulin, but they are still there. And that's, that was the big provocative claim. And, and, and many, pap many people later did confirm these uh, observations in, in additional uh, mouse models. So what I want to do now is to show you some, share with you some data from our own group that, that uh, address some of the remaining open questions in this, on this mechanism. One is that do we see that also in spontaneous diabetes models, and in particular uh, in human diabetes? Is, is this something artificial, or do we, does it, is it something that does happen, this de-differentiation or loss of identity that does happen in actual diabetes? How significant this is? Is this a reversible process? Can it go back in time? Is there really involvement of this induction of embryonic pro 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 program? Uh, what is the signaling pathway that leads from chronic glycemia, hyperglycemia to loss of identity, and, and, and how can we maintain uh, beta cell identity? So a, a crash course on uh, embryonic pancreas, embryonic development, something that everybody forgot, uh, we are used to think about the islet hormones as four, right? Insulin, glucagon, somatostatin, and pancre pancreatic peptide. But actually there are two more that are very abundant during um, uh, embryonic development of the islets. These are the uh, epsilon cells and the G cells producing the hormones ghrelin and, and gastrin. We kind of forgot about them because although they are abundant during pancreas development, we don't know what they do, and they are gone after birth in both, in both mice and humans. So it's, uh, they are hallmarks of fetal islets, but they don't exist at all in adult, uh, in adult islets. So we, are ask, we ask the question, do these fetal hormones reappear in, in, um, later on in life in, in, in diabetes? And the short answer is yes. So this is a study that we published uh, uh, earlier this year or last year on gastrin. So this is staining for gastrin, a hormone that is normally expressed in the, in the stomach, as you know, right? So in he healthy mice as well as humans, we see uh, nothing. But in mice with type 2 diabetes, as well as in humans with type 2 diabetes, we see abundant uh, gastrin-positive cells, up to 10% of the islet cells. And this often co-localizes with either insulin or somatostatin, suggesting that either beta cells or delta cells turn on uh, this hormone that they shouldn't. And as a minimum at this stage, we can say, well, we have now for the first time a marker of islet cell reprogramming, altered identity in human type 2 diabetes. We tried hard, but could not find that in type 1 autoimmune diabetes. It's really a matter of type 2 diabetes. Um, what else do we know about this process? Very briefly, so they turn on, the cells turn on in diabetes a fetal hormone. Does this really mean that they go back in time to the uh, fetal stages of fetal uh, uh, like gene expression? So we tested that. The key gene here is neurogenin 3, the transcription factor that is expressed only in embryonic life and is really orchestrating the, the differentiation of uh, uh, islet progenitor cells to the different hormone uh, cell types. Abundant, very abundant in embryonic development. But unlike what was proposed by Mimo Chile, we see no staining for NGN3 in, 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 in diabetes. And while in the embryo, it's highly expressed in, in diabetic mice, and also humans, we see no evidence for that. And we went further, because maybe we don't stain well. We generated mice where we deleted in adult beta cells this neurogenin 3. Right, so I won't get into the details, but these are mice that are knocked out for uh, neurogenin 3 in adult beta cells, and still, as these mice become diabetic, they express uh, gastrin just as well. Right, suggesting that NGN3 is not required for gastrin expression in, in diabetes, so it seems that beta cells switch directly to adopt gastrin cell identity without going back to um, uh, fetal uh, programs. Uh, the process is reversible. We take diabetic mice, DBDB, the obese uh, leptin receptor deficient mice, we see plenty of gastrin staining in red. You treat these mice with insulin, it's all gone. You take islets in vitro, you, add, you put them in high glucose, gastrin mRNA is induced, you, you put them back in normal glucose, it's gone. So it's a reversible process, this altered identity. 
We also know about the pathway. I'll not get too much into that, but this is the classical insulin secretion pathway, glucose, gets into the beta cell via GLU2, metabolized via glucokinase and mitochondria, ATP, closes the KTP channels, calcium entry, and insulin secretion. It turns out that overactivity of this same pathway is the, 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 the biochemical pathway that leads to induction of, of, um, of gastrin. Why do I say that? Because if, for example, you put islets in high glucose, gastrin is induced. But if you do that, the presence of a diazoxide that prevents the closure of this KTP channel, the opposite of uh, glabenclamide, this is prevented. And the same is true for calcium signaling. So this pathway is essential for um, gastrin expression in diabetes. So in summary of this part, some cells in, some beta cells in rodents and some beta and delta cells in, in human type 2 diabetes turn on this fetal islet uh, hormone gastrin. Uh, this requires calcium signaling, no involvement of embryonic type progenitor cells. It's reversible. We still don't know what is the functional, biological significance of that. And we still don't know the, the molecular machinery, what's the transcription factor that is turning this on. We published that earlier this year. In the last few minutes, I want to show you another story about uh, um, altered or, or lost, ident lost identity of, of beta cells in diabetes, which I think sheds light on, on how this uh, can happen. Uh, in humans. So, so in this project, we, we focused on PAX6. PAX6 is a transcription factor, uh, extremely extensively studied in many areas. In our, for our purpose, it's well established to have a key role in beta cell development during, during embryonic, embryonic development. PAX6 has to be there, otherwise you will not generate uh, beta cells. But PAX6 is maintained in, in adult, fully differentiated beta cells. So we were wondering, does it have a role in beta cell function doing adult life. And what prompted us was the observation that if we look at uh, um, beta cells from diabetic mice, their expression level of PAC, the expression level of PAC6 drops by half, suggesting that is, it is metabolically regulated and perhaps has some function. So to test the function of uh, PAC6 in adult beta cells, we uh, performed a genetic experiment experiment in mice where we deleted the PAX6 gene specifically in adult uh, beta cells during adult life using the Crelock system. I will not get into the technical details of that. I'll just show you the data. So when we delete PAX6 in adult beta cells of mice, uh, after you do that, a week or two after you do that, um, blood glucose levels go, extreme, become, go extremely high. Mice become hyperglycemic. And actually, very unusually for diabetic mice, they die. And we think they die because of, not because of hyperglycemia, but because of ketoacidosis. So uh, we see ketone bodies going up in their blood. The reason for all this is that beta cells are gone. So you take normal mice, you delete, beta cell, you delete PAC6 from their beta cells, and this is the insulin. See, beta cells are gone, and in parallel, alpha cells become more abundant. So this is the phenotype. But there's something funny here. Look, the, the islets don't shrink in size. They remain their, their normal size. Only insulin is gone. So we were wondering, what, what happened to these beta cells? Are they, have they died, or maybe something else happened to them? So to test that, we performed what's called genetic lineage tracing, where we irreversibly tagged the beta cells with the green fluorescent protein, right? And, and then asked, what happened, what happened to this green fluorescent protein labeled beta cells um, with time in the mutant? So this is what you see after we, we, after we delete, uh, one week after we delete uh, PAC6 and also turn on uh, this uh, yellow fluorescent protein, you see the islets have both yellow fluorescent protein and insulin. Six months later, all the red, most of the red is gone. Beta cells are gone. But look, it, the YFP, the yellow fluorescent protein is still there, suggesting that beta cells are still there. They haven't died. They just lost their identity. What happened to them? They turned on the, the fetal hormone ghrelin. Okay, these are the beta cells that Lost, beta, lost PAC6, suddenly they get, turn on a uh, 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 ghrelin expression. This doesn't show so well, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the bottom line of this um, slide is, is, a, is a molecular biology experiment where we try to ask how does PAC6 orchestrate all that. And the short answer after doing chromatin immune precipitation experiments is that what PAC6 does is that it binds to the DNA of many islet cell genes it drives the expression of beta cell genes, but it represses, that's the most important thing that it does, it actively represses the expression of non-beta cell genes in the islets. Surprisingly, and 
in contrast to what people thought about this gene, it's not just a transcription factor. Actually, most of, more than that, it's a repressor. So Pax6 represses the, 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 the non-beta cells genes that want to be expressed. So here is a model of how this works. So a normal life of the beta cell, Pax6, together with other factors, will bind to many promoters and lead to activation of beta cell genes like insulin and key transcription factor and will repress non-beta cell genes such as ghrelin, glucagon, somatostatin. Under you know, genetic, artificial genetic deficiency or chronic hyperglycemia, Pax6 is gone. And then the, the activation level of beta cell genes is re much reduced, but also the repression of those non-beta cell genes is removed, so they uh, are turned on. So Pax6 is needed to maintain beta cell identity and prevent kind of a default uh, uh, um, divergence to other fates. Is this relevant to humans? We think so. One reason we think so is that there are people who are born heterozygous for Pax6. Only half the dose of the gene is missing. These are glucose intolerant and eventually develop diabetes. So um, there is a link there. So, uh, so the hypothesis based on that is that reduced Pax6 in diabetes is a contributor to beta cell failure. I want to add two more facts and then summarize it all with a model. Uh, the two more facts that I'm not supporting by evidence, but it's published, is that um, when we look at what happens to beta cells in diabetes, in type 2 diabetes, they often adopt other cell identities, but never ever they cross the islet boundary. They turn on other hormones like glucagon, somatostatin. They never become liver cells or exocrine cells or something else. They, they, their, their switch is always within the, the endocrine identity. And the second thing is that many people like Pedro Herrera, which I understand presented here last year, are trying to look in the reverse direction. Is there a way to uh, turn non-beta cells into beta cells as a way for generative therapy? The emerging evidence from these studies is that this process can happen, but also, also always within the islet boundary. So non-beta cells in the islets, like alpha cells or delta cells, may under special circumstances become beta cells. But never ever you'll see duct cells or exocrine cells or liver cells spontaneously becoming beta cells. It's all within the confines of the islets. Leading me to this final um, comments on, on what's, how, how, I, how I see um, uh, uh, beta cell failure in the terms of beta cell identity in type 2 diabetes. So, the first concept is that beta cell identity is fragile, right? It's very easy to disrupt the identity of the beta cell, but the islet identity is stable. You, you'll never lose that, right? And, and the reason is that we now know from lots of extensive molecular studies that all islet cells, alpha cells, beta cells, delta cells, they share extreme similarity in, in the ep in epigenetic makeup, chromatin structure, DNA methylation. So they're really uh, brothers and sisters, and they're very similar to each other. Actually, besides the hormone genes, they're almost identical. So the way I came to think about that is that the, the, the islet cell types, re, re, the different islet cell types are really uh, flexible, reflect fre flexible states of the same cell, rather than uh, very stable subtypes of cells, which is a very different uh, view, of, much more plastic view of the islet uh, environment. A second thing is that there are multiple transcription factors that are essential to prevent this loosening of, of beta cell uh, identity and, and acquisition of other islet fates. For example, Ben Stanger has shown that if you lose PDX1, the key transcription factor from beta cells, they all turn on glucagon expression, essentially turn, become alpha cells. Um, Mikey Sander, Chris Wright showed that if you lose NKX6.1 or MNX1, to additional transcription factors in beta cells, you turn on somatostatin. We showed if you lose Pax6, you turn on mostly ghrelin, but also the other hormone genes. We don't know what prevents beta cells from turning on gastrin. How does this connect to, to the metabolic derangements in diabetes? Well, it turns out, bad luck, that the, the key transcription factor, tract factors that are supposed to maintain beta cell identity, like PDX1, uh, NKX6.1, um, um, are also highly sensitive to oxidative stress. So in conditions of high hyperglycemia, oxidative stress, the activity of these factors is reduced, which may link metabolic stress to acceleration of uh, uh, loss of beta cell identity and a vicious cycle leading to beta cell failure in diabetes. The last point I want to make is that this so-called fragile identity, the mirror image of that is plasticity. 
within the islet boundaries. And the bad direction is when under metabolic stress, beta cells lose their identity and become non-beta cells. But the opportunity here is that this also may open you know, a conceptual framework for uh, using this plasticity and, and moving non-beta cells to become uh, beta cells uh, within the islets. Of course, there are many challenges that remain. Actually, we, we are not certain yet what's the actual impact of this uh, compromised beta cell identity on glycemic control in type 2 diabetes. Some people, there is emerging evidence that this happens also in early type 2 diabetes, but we don't know. What do, the fet what do these fetal hormones do in, in adult eye biology, if anything? Um, a key question I have no answer to is, is, is there a point of no return for beta cell failure? Everything so far seems reversible. Is there a point after so many years of hyper, severe hyperglycemia where beta cell failure is really permanent in type 2 diabetes? We don't know. There's no good evidence, I think. What determines the direction of identity change? <laughs> Will alpha cells become beta cells or beta cells switch to alpha cells? We don't really understand that. And, and, and the future perspective really is to think of ways to lock this beta, the beta cell identity to prevent it from, from loosening uh, under metabolic stress. I'll stop here. I'll just show uh, the people that contribute to this work. So everything that I do is in very close collaboration with uh, Ben Glazer. Some of you may know him is, the, is an endocrinology. He's my clinical half. He's the head of endocrinology at uh, Adassa uh, um, Medical School. And he's a uh, uh, lab member. It's also a collaboration with Klaus Kastner from University of uh, Pennsylvania and a collaboration with Peter Intveld from Brussels, Fran Ashcroft from uh, um, Oxford, and Paul Robertson. Thank you very much.